Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jessica DeBerry. I serve as a health scientist and project officer in the Division of Research within the Office of Epidemiology and Research at the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, Health Resources and Services Administration. The Division of Research provides ongoing support for MCH extramural research activities, including the Engaging Research Innovations and Challenges, or the Enrich webinar series. You are joining a community of more than 100 participants with interest in advancing MCH research. The Enrich webinar series provides technical assistance and methodologic <laughs> updates aimed at stimulating interest in applied and translational MCH research. Today's webinar is about secondary data analysis in autism research using the Interactive Autism Network, Ian Data. Before we start, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Debbie Linares, who also serves as a health scientist and project officer in our division. Now let me briefly introduce our speakers for this afternoon, Drs. Paul Lipkin and J. Kylie Law. Dr. Lipkin is the Director of Medical Informatics and the Interactive Autism Network at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, and is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Lipkin's clinical and research careers have focused on the early identification, evaluation, and treatment of children and adolescents with developmental disabilities, including autism, learning, and attention disorders. Dr. Law is a research associate in the Department of Pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Law is the mom and caregiver of a young adult with ASD. She recognizes the unique value of information collected directly from those living with the struggles and triumphs of aut autism every day. Before we begin our presentation, we'd like to gauge the audience's prior knowledge of secondary data analysis in autism research. On your screen, you'll see poll questions. In the first question, we'd like to rate your current knowledge of the topic, one being limited and five being high. And for the second question, we'd like you to rate your skill level in the topic area before today's webinar. Please go ahead and answer these questions now. I see the responses coming in. It looks like we have a good distribution of skill levels. I'll let you continue responding. Um, but thank you so much for participating in this poll. And I will now turn the program over to Dr. Linares, who will share with us some information about the HRSA Autism Secondary Data Analysis Research Program. Thank you, Jessica. The Division of Research within the Office of Epidemiology and Research at the Maternal Child Health Bureau, Health Resources and Services Administration, supports the R40 Maternal and Child Health Autism Secondary Data Analysis Research Program, also known as the Autism SDAR Program. The purpose of this grant program is to support innovative secondary data analysis research focused on generating new evidence regarding disparities in and access to screening, diagnosis, and treatment for children and youth with autism spectrum disorder. At this Enrich webinar, we are hoping to support the use of multiple and interdisciplinary data sets for the Autism SDAR program. Now I will turn the program over to our speakers, Drs. Lipkin and Law, to begin today's webinar. Thank you. Um, and I, I, um, this is Paul Lipkin, and I'd like to uh, thank both Jessica and Debbie for asking us to participate in this program. Um, <clears throat> um, what, we have a few objectives uh, that we'd like to cover over the course of this presentation. Um, uh, one, um, we will uh, be making you familiar with the Interactive Autism Network and um, its use as a platform for autism research. And at the same time, what we like to do is relate the work that we're doing to other similar um, autism-focused uh, data networks. Um, and so I'll be um, providing some uh, more information on the Autism Treatment Network and ARP, um, PCORnet, um, uh, and specifically PEDSnet within that, as well as a new network uh, called SPARC. Um, um, and the, the, um, the ultimate goal here is to, for you to consider future efforts at linking um, uh, multiple autism networks, whether it be Ian as well as the others, uh, uh, with the aim of advancing the health and well-being of children with autism. So uh, to begin, um, I'd just like to uh, provide a framework, a framework uh, for the discussion. Um, I think uh, many of you are health researchers um, and uh, look at data from multiple different data resources. Um, I like to think of networks as uh, occurring uh, uh, as being of five types. Uh, the traditional public health networks, um, um, many of which are hosted um, by Maternal Child Health Bureau and HRSA, um, as well as by the CDC, particularly around autism. Um, there are administrative 
uh, there are networks that are based upon administrative data um, as well, uh, also uh, commonly used uh, um, from federal networks. Um, but what I'm going to feature today are, are, are three other types, because I think these types um, may be uh, new to uh, many of you. Um, and I think uh, what, what I would like to do is to, um, to bring up the concept of what we're trying to do is provide a, a good full picture of the child with autism by looking at the clinical data networks, participant-centered uh, data networks, as well as um, hybrids of all of these. Um, so uh, just to frame uh, my model here, uh, for clinical data networks, uh, these are typically uh, site or center-based networks. Uh, the uh, Autism Treatment Network and ARP, or the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, are a prime example of a clinical network. Um, they derive their data uh, typically from direct clinical testing of a child or a parent, um, um, but also rely upon clinician judgment in terms of the data that they gather. Importantly, from my perspective, and the reason it's highlighted in red here, is that it's important to, while these are clinical data sets, the, the information is, is clearly and frequently um, derived from either parent um, or patients um, themselves, and sometimes from, teach uh, from teachers also. Um, there are other clinical networks that rely completely upon electronic medical records, or EMR. Um, and you're going to hear about PCORnet and PEDNET, uh, which is a clinical data research network focused on EMRs. Um, and then there are also clinical trial networks. I will not be talking about those today. <clears throat> um, uh, and then uh, what may be a new framework for you are what uh, we call participant-powered uh, research networks or, or patient-centered research networks. Um, and they will typically uh, get their data from, a, uh, in the case of children, from a parent, or in the case of an adult, from self-report. And this data is usually comes from proprietary surveys, from standardized questionnaires, or sometimes from clinical trials. And our network, the Interactive Autism Network, is such a, a participant-powered research network. Um, and then there are some hybrid networks, uh, which combine both participant data and uh, clinical data. And um, SPARC is a new network uh, that I'll be telling you uh, about towards the end of this um, that is such a hybrid. Um, and it's important to now recognize that we have multiple different data sources with different types of data that are being um, provided um, uh, with the aim of providing this really more holistic view of the child or the adult with autism. And with that, I, I'll turn over the microphone to uh, Kylie Law. Thank you, Paul. Um, nice to be here uh, this afternoon. And uh, for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I am going to share with you more about the Interactive Autism Network and about the data we have available for secondary analysis. As Paul mentioned, Ian is a participant-powered research network. Our mission is to improve the lives of those with autism and their families by accelerating research. We do this by engaging the autism community in all aspects of research, including priority setting, hypothesis generation, study design and implementation, dissemination of results, and also the integration of results into everyday life. We have two interconnected web-based platforms. EN Research is our secure online research portal. Participants register, consent, and complete the online study protocol. Participants also agree to be recontacted about future research opportunities led by outside research teams. The EN Research Protocol is approved by the Johns Hopkins Medical Institution, IRB. EN Community is our primary engagement and communication outlet. Here we provide the community with original articles as well as other informational resources about autism. The articles focus on topics that are important to the autism community and always include what is known about the topic because of research. We also try to highlight research that our families participated in and that would have otherwise not been possible. EN is a family-centered research registry. Participants include children with autism and their parents, as well as unaffected siblings. We also have adults with autism, including those who are independent and those under guardianship. You can see the approximate numbers 
uh, here that have joined since we launched. One special note to make about our adult population. Approximately 5,000 of these adults were originally consented into Ian as children and have now reached 18 years of age. We can still reach many of them through their parents. However, we are currently working on a process to identify their legal status and then re-consent them as independent adults into the registry. Ian Community has a significant following across the world, uh, which includes 1.26 million visits per year to the website. A critical part of our community engagement plan is also our Community Advisory Council. The council includes 62 individuals who work with us to identify priority topics that uh, need to be addressed by the network. Within, with the next few slides, I want to focus on the data available in Ian. All Ian data is either proxy report or self-report and was collected via the Internet. We use Internet-mediated research standards in our data collection protocol. Although there are many ways of categorizing our data, I decided here to lump the data in the following buckets, registration data, standardized measures, data obtained from our baseline custom questionnaires, and from topic-specific surveys. As I go through each category of data, I will also provide an example of how the data has been used in research publications. In total, we have about 30 plus publications using EN data that include EN staff on the author list. There's probably another 30 plus publications that have been authored independently by other researchers using the de-identified data set. So depending on the hypothesis and the data required, some secondary data analysis projects do require close collaboration with the EN team. So first of all, I want to talk about laying the groundwork uh, before I dive into the types of data. So I want to talk specifically about two important studies that we did early on to look at the validity of parent-reported autism diagnosis. When we first started Ian, one of the biggest criticisms we received from the research community was skepticism as to whether or not the children registered really had autism. We did two studies looking at this. The first, a validation study, involved recruiting a subsample of families into three different uh, three different ASD research sites, uh, Kennedy Krieger, Wash U, and UCLA. These children received the gold standard evaluation for autism, including the ADOS, the ADIR, and the Vineland. We found that depending on the algorithm used, the ASD diagnosis was confirmed in 93 to 99% of the children. We did a second study, referred to as a verification study, where we asked a subsample of families to send in documentation of their child's ASD diagnosis. Again, 98% of families verified their child's diagnosis. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about Ian registration data. Each individual consented in Ian has basic demographic data, including age, race, ethnicity, as well as geographic location. Since we cannot distribute full zip codes as de-identified data, we sometimes do customary, a custom data manipulation as needed to assign urban-rural classification of the family's residents. Registration data also includes relationship information and the role of the individual within the family. For example, proband, sibling, parent one, or parent two. I wanted to make a special note here Although parent one and parent two are el eligible to participate, the parent role in Ian is primarily fulfill fulfilled by mothers. Only about 10% 10 10 of our families have fathers enrolled. Thus, our family sets have been referred to as maternal clans. Uh, we use this relationship data to also help us identify special subsets in Ian, such as twin sets. Uh, last we looked, we had about 650 twin sets. We also capture ASD diagnosis status at the time of registration. 
Um, I have only looked at this preliminarily, but I do think there are some interesting trends to explore in this data over the last 10 years um, as clinicians in the community have transitioned from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 terminology. So here's our first example of how e and data has been used. This, is, this example is unusual in that it, just, it uses just registration data. This was actually the first publication that came from Ian. The author was interested in developing a theoretical model to explain why some families with, with multiple children had very high recurrence rates of autism, 50%, while other families with multiple children had relatively low recurrence rates. And he wanted to tie this in to what was known currently about autism genetics. As you can see in this study, the author used three data sets, including Ian's maternal clans. One of the things I want to point out here is that one of the strengths of the Ian data set, even in this very early study, is its size. OK, now to talk a little bit about the standard measures available in Ian. Uh, we have only a handful of these in Ian, uh, and three of the ones listed have only recently been added to the protocol. We have three autism-specific instruments, the social communication uh, questionnaire, which is a screening tool. We use it, uh, the standard cutoff threshold, to confirm the child's autism diagnosis. The social responsiveness scale is commonly used in ASD research as a measure of autism severity. For both of these measures, data is collected on the proband and the sibling. Recently, for our self-reporting independent adults, we added the autism spectrum quotient to the protocol. We also very recently added a Promise Global Health measure for both adults and children. So here's a second example of a study that was based solely on the SCQ and the SRS data collected from Ian families. In this study, the authors analyzed ASD diagnosis status based on the SCQ results and specific ASD symptomatology using subdomains in the SRS to look at the new diagnostic criteria proposed in the DSM-5 and then they compared that to the diagnostic criteria in the DSM-4. Again, I would emphasize the large number of children included in this study at almost 15,000. Um, also, a critical piece of this data analysis was the large number of SCQ and SRS scores that were available on unaffected siblings. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about our baseline custom questionnaires. Uh, these are, as the title uh, indicates, are custom designed. The topics covered are generally basic topics that are important to researchers and the ASD community. For children with ASD, the baseline questionnaire asks about the child's birth history, developmental milestones, first signs of autism, ASD diagnosis history, current level of functioning, behavioral problems and concerns, and family characteristics such as household size, income, and parent education level. We also have a school services baseline questionnaire that looks at the child's school environment and special education services and asks about the family's experiences, both positive and negative, with the child's school system. Um, and we are uh, working on a comorbidities questionnaire right now, which should be uh, coming later this uh, in the summer or early fall. Uh, we also have a set of sibling questionnaires. Uh, these are largely a subset of the same questions we ask of the child with autism. And this data is often used as a comparison group in uh, data analysis. For our adults, the baseline questionnaires include questions on diagnosis history, gender and sexuality, daily life, medications and therapies, access to health care, and ASD-related challenges and research priorities. Our adult surveys are newly launched, and thus we have a much smaller data set right now. 
So here's a third example. This is a study that used both registration and baseline questionnaire data. At the time it was published in 2009, there were only a handful of other published twin studies in autism, and the largest at that time was fewer than 50 twin sets. This study was five times larger and looked at Ian's 277 twin sets. As I mentioned earlier, we now have 650 twin sets uh, for someone to look at. Um, the authors of this study looked at concordance rates in both dizygotic and monozygotic twins and the influence of gender in concordance rates. Twins were also compared based on other characteristics such as ASD severity, history of skill loss, and comorbid conditions such as ADHD, bipolar, anxiety, and seizure disorders. And then finally, I'm going to talk about our topic-specific surveys. As you can tell, these cover a broad range of topics. Many of the topics percolate up through the community as high-priority topics. Uh, in the development of these surveys, we collaborate with other researchers, clinicians, families, and advocacy groups to make sure all perspectives are included and that the resulting data can be used for meaningful analysis. And so here we have another example. Um, this is uh, Ian's research study on wandering and elopement in children with autism. Uh, prior to this study, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence that children with autism were more likely to wander and or intentionally escape from safe places and adult supervision. Uh, there was a steady stream of news reports about children with autism who went missing, and sometimes these events ended in injury and fatality. This was the first study looking at the frequency of this problem and the impact of the behaviors on children with autism and their families. Interestingly, although this publication has fewer citations in the research literature, it has a massive number of Google hits and references in the lay media. Uh, autism advocacy groups have used this data to influence public policy and to garner funding to keep children with ASD safe by preventing elopement and wandering. Programs have also been developed um, based on this study to train first responders on the unique characteristics of autism that are important to know when searching for a missing child with the disorder. And so how do you access Ian data? Uh, you can visit the data services section on Ian Community. Um, we require a short online application as well as evidence that of an IRB approval slash waiver. It's generally a waiver because it's the identified data. And um, you need to complete a data use agreement. Um, because we spend staff time and effort to prepare a custom data set for you, uh, we do charge a nominal fee to recover uh, some of the costs associated with preparing the data set. Uh, also available on the Ian Community, you will find our data code books and summary, summary reports for most of the questionnaires. We all, uh, for most of the questionnaires, we also have other services, including recruitment assistance and online data collection. Uh, since we launched, uh, Ian has matched families with over 500 research studies. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Paul to talk about other autism networks. Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Kylie. Um, everyone can hear me now, I'm assuming. Um, um, what, uh, uh, what we'd like to do is not only uh, expose you to um, the availability of the data that we um, offer through Ian, um, or our interactive autism network, but also uh, a, a group of other important data networks that you might not be familiar with. And so um, I'd like to thank uh, the people from these networks who contributed to these slides that you're going to be seeing here, and some might see who are on the call today. Um, but I'll be telling you a little bit about uh, the Autism Treatment Network and the Autism Intervention Research Network, or ATN and ARP. Um, again, I'll be uh, talking a little bit about PCORnet and uh, PEDSnet uh, w from within that network. And then finally, I'll give you some information on Spark, or a new network uh, being that's been created by the Simons Foundation. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the ATN and ARP, um, um, as you see on the slide, our, it has a wide range of objectives, uh, not only uh, for 
uh, research, but to, to determine best practices in the field of autism, to disseminate information on care of children with autism, to engage families around uh, the issues that are important to them, to mentor new investigators, and to provide a quality and practice improvement framework uh, for clinical sites. Um, there are 13 uh, networks uh, across North America. Uh, and you can see them listed here on the slide. Um, they are um, um, all in the United States with the exception of two up in Canada um, and, um, and go from the East Coast to the West. Um, over the course um, of the past eight years, uh, they too have been uh, gathering a large amount of data on children with autism. Uh, they have an enrollment of more than 7,000 children. They've, uh, uh, they've implemented 35 research studies in their eight years. Uh, and you can see some of the other uh, important accomplishments that they've achieved over this time. Um, importantly, there's five practice guidelines that have come, um, come from it to assist clinicians in the field. Uh, their registry data uh, are in the categories you see here, uh, including demographics, diagnostic uh, information, cognitive and adaptive skills of the children, uh, medical data, um, behavioral and psychosocial data, and communication skills in a subset. Um, their data can be accessed at this website or uh, www.asatn.org. And uh, this data is open to all researchers. Um, and on that page, there's a button um, on the left-hand side where you can access that data. And uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, PCORNet and its range of networks. Um, um, many of you may not be familiar with PCORNet. This is a, uh, a government-funded, um, non-governmental organization that was funded through the Affordable Care Act. Um, and uh, PCORI um, was intended uh, to improve patient-centered outcome research um, over the years. Uh, within PCORI, uh, a group of networks um, were pulled together into what we now call PCORNet. Um, uh, with, whose vision is to engage in large-scale clinical research uh, and to provide this research uh, at an enhanced quality and efficiency uh, with the mission of enabling people to make informed healthcare decisions by efficiently conducting clinical research relevant to their needs. It's important that you see in this description there's nothing here about children, and there's nothing here about autism. So uh, PCORNet is aimed at, um, um, at all health conditions at this point in time. Um, so essentially, uh, PCORNA is a network of networks. Um, it's first um, important to describe uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, patient-powered research networks, or PPRN. Uh, they are, there are 20 of them with that throughout the country. Uh, we are the um, PCORNET's autism research node. Uh, so um, of these 20 networks, we are the only one representing autism. Um, there are a group of other pediatric conditions, including the Rare Epilepsy Network, the Phelan McDermott Syndrome Network, um, uh, the Mood Network, um, which uh, cover children, uh, but we are the only autism network within this. Just to give you some idea, other kinds of health conditions that may fit within these patient powered research networks are uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, um, vasculitis, heart disease, and so on. In addition, PCORNet has 13 clinical data research networks. As you can see from the symbols, uh, these are um, data networks that, um, whose data is derived from a hospital and clinical settings. Um, they also are spread throughout the United States. Some are regional and others are based upon other characteristics. Um, and together, um, these 20 PPRNs and 13 CDRNs compose PCORNet and create this national infrastructure for people-centered clinical research. The result is a national evidence system that is aimed to uh, provide research readiness. Um, and at this point in time, in most recent data, uh, there were 42,000 uh, sets of uh, uh, patients represented uh, with, uh, whose data was available for clinical trials, and uh, uh, 42 million, I should say. And there were 83 million um, uh, sets of patient data that were available for observational studies. The demographic makeup you could see highlighted uh, by means of this slide. Um, it's a slight female predominance over male. Um, uh, race, racially, uh, there is more white representation than non-white at this point in time, but there's still a lot of missing data. Um, the um, age range uh, within PCORNet tends to be clustered around adults. 
because as, you, as I described to you, there are many health conditions represented here. But you see there is a, a good piece of information on children from the ages of 5 to 14. Uh, and all in all, um, PCORNA represents about 110 million patients across the country who have had a medical encounter in the past five years. There, there's tons of potential uh, data here uh, that uh, people are going to be capitalizing upon in the coming years. Uh, just uh, to, to give you a sense of, of, of the speed with it, which this has been done, PCORNET is now um, in its uh, third, or, uh, third year of funding. Um, and so in the course of uh, these three years, uh, these networks have been pulled together into this national network. And the intent then is uh, to uh, have a community of research that will unite data from multiple sources, patients, researchers, clinicians, and health systems, uh, and then to have the data ready uh, for investigators to use. Um, and um, a common data model is being employed so all these multiple networks um, are going to be able to share information in a common informatics savvy um, means. Um, every piece of data that you see described here in blue um, are already placed in the common data model. And you can see most, most of this is traditional health data that would come from an electronic medical record um, or from claims records, for example. Um, but uh, there is the intent to add other domains, such as socioeconomic status and biospecimen genomic data as well. PCORNET um, is, has uh, created um, a, a central coordinating center at who, who has a front door open for researchers. Um, so if you as a researcher want to access this data, you'd enter the front door of the coordinating center of PCORNET, uh, and that would give you access to the multiple uh, uh, networks that are represented. Um, a query can be done, and uh, there are opportunities here for you to do research on whatever research question you may have. PEDSnet I wanted to feature here today because they are the ones that we have been uh, collaborating most with for, as a clinical data research network. Uh, PEDSnet is specifically uh, aimed to be a, a national pediatric learning health system um, aimed at conducting multi-institutional pediatric research um, uh, with a vision uh, uh, to be the premier multi-specialty multi national pediatric clinical network for conducting research in routine healthcare settings. Uh, members are all children's hospitals across the country. Uh, there are eight in total, and you can see them highlighted on this slide. Um, so there's uh, the Nemours Health System, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Nationwide Children's in Ohio, Cincinnati Children's, Boston Children's, a Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Children's Hospital of Colorado, and Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, and so uh, they currently have data in actually more than 5 million children across the country um, and are pooling their data uh, through this common data model. Uh, the, uh, the question has come, how could they be useful in the field of autism research? So uh, uh, in our collaboration with, with them uh, this past summer, um, we did a quick uh, search and I, you should know that this really just took a, a few days where they were able to glean the entire network of uh, millions of children um, from within their network. Uh, this represented data from six of the eight networks. And, um, and uh, what they did was they looked at autism coding uh, within their network um, and uh, used uh, ICD-9 and 10 codes as well as another set of coding known as SNOMED. Um, all in all, there were f almost 4 million children represented within this data. Um, and, uh, and they did a, a head count, a prevalence count, and came up with 53,485 children who were coded as having an autism spectrum disorder. This was the first look at this data. And uh, what we were amazed at is they came up with a prevalence of 1 in 72 children within their network of having autism. This is a very close parallel to very similar information that was derived from CDC's um, ADAM network. Um, as well as from um, um, the uh, National Health Surveys uh, sponsored by the Maternal Child Health Bureau. So uh, there is a ton of information available now within PEDSnet uh, that we haven't quite tapped into yet that holds much promise in the years ahead. If you also look at the gender ratio, you'll also see also very much in parallel uh, with research uh, done out of the CDC and MCHB in the past. So PEDSnet is showing us a tremendous amount of potential for the uh, for autism research that we have uh, that we are hoping to tap into over the coming years. 
Um, and so what we're looking for is to develop this holistic view um, of children uh, with autism where we can derive data from public health uh, uh, registries, from clinician-derived networks, from EHR data networks, as well as from participant tower networks. So we get a rich and full view of the child. Um, and so um, we've worked in collaboration with the people from PEDSnet and the people uh, with the ATN ARP um, and, uh, to, uh, and compare the data that we have. Uh, and what I'm going to do is show you uh, very quickly now the kind of data that these networks have in place, uh, the large number of uh, children represented, and the potential that you may have uh, to tap into this re these research networks in the years ahead. So if you look, uh, PEDSnet, um, um, as of our count about last, uh, last month or so, had about 71,000 children with autism represented below the age of 18. Ian had 17,000, and um, ATN ARP had 7,000 children. Um, the um, age of these children at, uh, at this point ranges from, uh, on average, uh, from 12 to 14. Um, and uh, we have information on when they were diagnosed in the case of Ian and the ATN ARP. Um, uh, the, the gender ratio is nearly identical across sites. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of ethnic representation. Um, Ian and um, ATN ARP tend to have a, a clear uh, white predominance. Uh, there's greater uh, African American representation uh, through the PEDSnet data. Uh, but remember, this is the identified data they're looking at. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly, but these are the categories of data. And uh, it'll give you some sense about what uh, which network is best for what types of data. So um, each of these networks has really very rich demographic data. Um, um, but when you want, if you want to look at parent or household data, Ian, as a, a participant-powered network, probably has the richest information about the child and about the entire household of family members. ATN has some of that, particularly around the child um, um, uh, the parent, not siblings necessarily. In terms of health care providers, uh, PEDSnet and ATN have uh, rich information with that. Uh, and PEDSnet has the uh, most uh, richest information on health care utilization, given that the information is coming from hospital and clinical registries. Uh, the diagnostic information is quite similar um, across, um, across the websites, across the networks. Um, medication information is available from PEDSnet and the ATN and ARP. There are different types of health indicators available through the different networks, as you can see here. The most medically focused would be from PEDSnet um, and um, ATN ARP. Uh, payer information is available through all three networks. Um, developmental, uh, developmental milestone information is available through Ian uh, very specifically. And then if you want standardized measures, um, the ATN has a very rich uh, uh, source of data um, on different standardized measures, which you could see listed here. Uh, we have a, a smaller amount, and as already described by Kylie, of the social responsiveness scale, the social communication questionnaire, as, uh, as well as now the ADHD questionnaire uh, for adults and the Promise Global Health Scale. In, in the few minutes that remain, um, what I'd like to do is tell you about uh, sort of the, the two other important bits of information uh, to know uh, for of the coming year, um, and that is a PCORnet is um, shifting and is, going to be, is being renamed as the P People Centered Research Foundation, or PCRF. Uh, the former FDA commissioner, uh, Dr. Robert Califf, is now chairing that board, um, and um, and uh, so PCORnet is being reorganized outside of PCORI, um, and is looking to become an independent organization. Um, it's forming collaborative research groups, and there is a pediatric research group specifically, and more specifically, an autism research in research interest group, which I am co-leading at this point in time. So uh, keep your ears out on this one. Let me uh, move on. The other, uh, the other one uh, to know about is SPARC. Uh, so um, the Simons Foundation, um, um, which is a partner of Ian's, um, is, has uh, been over the past year developing a network of their own. Um, and uh, SPARC's aim is to recruit, engage, and retain uh, 50,000 individuals with autism along with their family members over the coming years. Um, and uh, their, their aim is, is to both combine the um, participant uh, 
powered information along with the clinical derived information into a large set of data available for researchers in the field of autism. They're recruiting subjects from a wide range of resources, uh, including Ian, as well as advocacy community-based organizations uh, from the um, a national media campaign and the community at large, as well as from clinical sites. And you can see that they have 21 clinical sites now who've been granted money for recruiting uh, children into SPARC. Um, so they are still in the recruitment phase, uh, but they are growing very quickly. Uh, so if you look at this uh, triangle um, uh, that we have here, um, there are already 13,000 um, families um, who have been recruited um, into, into um, SPARC. Um, they are, uh, their aim is to get um, uh, genetic data on um, every one of these trios. So far, uh, 6,500 of them have consented to genetic testing, and uh, 4,000 have lab testing available. So this is going to be a very large uh, and important pool uh, to be looking towards uh, in the future. Uh, again, right now they are in the registration phase. So uh, what I'd like to do is to end at this point um, and to really, uh, hopefully, uh, I've created for you uh, this broad view of the autism networks that are centered now on improving care for children with autism. And our hope is that by pulling together the different uh, types of data and the different networks of data, we'll come up with a much richer source of uh, information on the child, whether it be from a clinical perspective, whether it be from a family perspective, whether it be from a community perspective about the health and well-being of these children. Um, I think we are at the beginning of an, an, an important um, decade in, in the years ahead um, uh, do this potential networking of these networks um, uh, in the field of autism. I'd like to thank you um, again for listening. Thank you so much, Drs. Lipkin and Law, for an informative and interesting presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with the MCH community. We're now ready for the question and answer period. I believe I see the first question has come in. Do you have any information about services received birth to three after an ASD diagnosis in the Ian data set? Yeah, so this is Kylie. I'm uh, thinking really quickly uh, what we have uh, available. Uh, we may have some available uh, data available on that uh, in the birth and ASD diagnosis history questionnaire. Um, I'm, it would probably be a, a limited amount of data because um, we try not to do too much historical uh, data collection. Um, although we do do a little bit, little bit of that when uh, families uh, first join. An important uh, a bit of information to add here is um, uh, we've been around for 10 years. Um, the information we collect uh, 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 in terms of those type of services is collected at one point in time. Uh, we have an opportunity to do longitudinal questioning around these services. Um, but, uh, so we may have that information on a child who's now 12, for example. Um, um, or we may have information on a 12-year-old as to what he's getting now. So we, um, so um, it's a little bit of a moving target with those for that kind of type of data. Great, thank you. Next question: What are some of the limitations in the Ian data set? Uh, very good question. Well, I, I would say one of the biggest limitations is uh, it's a self-selected sample. Um, I think similar to other disease-based volunteer registries, uh, families that participate are, are choosing to participate, and in many, many ways they are very active and very involved uh, families. Uh, as Paul mentioned in our demographic data, which I didn't, uh, I didn't show our table one, uh, but we do, we do know that our um, participants tend to um, be more white, uh, they tend to be more well educated. Um, and um, more well-resourced uh, than the general population. Thank you. Are there any linkages between the 7,000 clinical registry children and the same entrance in Ian? So we are actually working on uh, developing a pilot to, to try to look at that. Um, so we in Ian also collect something that's uh, called the indar GUID, so the National Database of Autism Research global unique identifier. So, uh, and then the ATN uh, for some of their families also collects 
uh, the same uh, elements to create an indar GUID. Uh, so the hope is with these um, indar GUIDs, you could actually uh, link together the records between the two data sets. Uh, we have not done it yet, uh, but we are in discussions uh, with the ATN uh, leaders to see what, what we could do. And we've also actually had this discussion with the PEDSnet uh, leaders, like is it possible to also identify these children within the PEDSnet uh, records and, um, and look at them there as well. Um, uh, uh, Pocornet's um, Autism Research Interest Group is going to be uh, focusing over the next year on some projects that will hopefully be beginning to doing uh, that type of uh, that type of work, um, really to link them together. That's that's obviously the goal we all want to have the richest information on the child. This next question may require some additional thought. Um, are there any seminal publications that stemmed from an analysis utilizing the Ian data source? Um, um, I will speak, and uh, Kylie can clarify for me. I have the advantage of of, uh, of stepping into Ian uh, three years ago, and so uh, so I have sort of an outsider's perspective as well as an insider's at this point. I think that genetic data uh, that was described um, by Kylie has really been quite seminal in terms of uh, the kind of information it did provide um, that was not available uh, previous um, because of the, uh, because of the large data set that we had. Um, I think there's been a tremendous amount of, 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 of um, social science that's been able to e be achieved uh, uh, related to community services as well. So a uh, colleague had mentioned uh, the wandering and elopement study. Uh, there's been some really uh, rich information um, as well derived on bullying as an example. Um, there was a very nice paper looking at medical home and uh, challenges that families are having around that. So those are really all very uh, rich um, uh, uh, papers, manuscripts that have come from that data set. Um, we actually, uh, we right now are hosting um, another uh, researcher, uh, Carla Mazevsky uh, from Pittsburgh, who's developing uh, uh, a, a clinical uh, research tool and emotional dysregulation uh, questionnaire um, that our families have contributed to as well. Thank you. How do you deal with selection bias within Ian? Um, I'm assuming you're, ref you're referring to the sort of self-selection of our participants. Um, and for that, I mean, we, we report it as a limitation, um, you know, in the discussion section. Um, now, we have tried in the past um, to, you know, if we're inviting families to participate in an, in a, in an outside study or in a new questionnaire, we will sometimes uh, target just a subsample of our families, and in, in that targeted some subsample, we will oversample uh, minority and traditionally underrepresented families that are participating in the N. Uh, it looks like they also asked about um, ATN and ARP. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I know some representatives from, the, from the, uh, those from those networks are on this call. Uh, um, but um, you know, I think they too uh, uh, would recognize that uh, there are some inherent biases that just need to be reported. Great, thank you. Are there any efforts to recruit a more diverse ASD community to enter and participate in Ian? Uh, yes. So uh, in the last 18 months, uh, as part of our engagement activities that are funded by uh, PCORI uh, in regards to our participation in PCORNet, we have uh, done some uh, specific outreach efforts to target underrepresented uh, populations. Um, some of the things that we've done is um, we've worked with uh, researchers who, are, who had existing projects that were looking at the experiences of minority populations in their autism journey. Um, we've also uh, started partnering uh, with some of the other PPRNs to, that, have, that are not disease specific, but that are focused on uh, the community at large. Um, and within those communities, uh, there's also uh, some of them have focused primarily on underrepresented populations. And so trying to work with these um, other PPRNs in identifying families that are struggling uh, with raising a child with autism and trying to engage them in, um, in autism research. Uh, I, I think we also forgot to mention uh, that we are an English-only website, 
and uh, so um, that's another bias that we have, and that we will not have any non-English speaking people participating. Great. Thank you so much, Drs. Lipkin and Law, for a great presentation and for sharing your expertise. Um, we are nearing the end of our time today, so if you did not get a chance to ask your question for the speaker, please still feel free to submit your question through the Q&A field, and we'll try to respond to your questions after the webinar. Thank you all for your attendance and participation. I also want to thank Leah Dyson, Lonnie Moore, Debbie Linares, and the presenters, and the technical team at Alterum Institute for helping to organize this event. An archive of today's webinar will be available on the Division of Research website at the Maternal and Child Health Bureau Office of Epidemiology and Research in several, several weeks. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.